So we'll get started. And um, I know most of you, but not all of you. So I am Jesse Mahoney, and I am a pediatrician who now is a full-time um, coach. And I do what I call mindful coaching. And you'll hear why I incorporate mindfulness as we talk about decisions. And mindfulness is absolutely needed for decision-making. And um, I worked in physician wellness for about 20 years before um, becoming a coach. And I now um, do retreats and do group coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I do these sessions, curious about coaching every once in a while. And I like to remind people that we are trained to be skeptical um, as physicians. And we're trained to um, ask a lot of questions and be hesitant to jump into things. And so one of the reasons that I like to do these sessions is to give people a chance to sort of see what coaching is about, see um, and learn something. And I like to usually pick a topic just for fun. And this topic actually came up during the last session I did, which was on um, how to be less tired and less overwhelmed. And we talked about the thought patterns and the habits that lead us to feel that way. And during that, one of the things that came up was indecision and having trouble ruminating about things and having trouble making decisions. Um, usually it's life decisions. It's not usually patient care decisions. For most of you, I think almost all of you are doctors, if not all of you, um, we have no trouble making decisions about um, patient care at all. In fact, we make so many decisions, we tend to have decision fatigue. And so um, we also tend to think that our decisions outside of the exam room and the operating room are life and death decisions, even when they're not. So separating out those can be really, really helpful. And so this idea of um, indecision and the expensive cost of decision making came up in that last session. And so we talked about um, doing another session where I talked a little bit about tools for um, decision-making. And so that's how we got to um, this topic. And so what I wanted to do here is I usually like to share some tips in the beginning, and then I'll have you guys ask questions, and then I can jump into a little bit of coaching if people want to get coached on either a decision or on something else. Um, but just to start off, I like to talk about the thought patterns um, that cause whatever problem it is that people are getting stuck on. So we actually have a lot of thought patterns that were trained into us as physicians that make decision-making hard, um, especially decision-making um, outside of the exam room where we don't have evidence-based information to make that decision as to, you know, where we should send our kid to school or where which hotel we should stay in. But we try to bring that evidence-based mind to it, and we end up ruminating and expending tremendous amount of energy um, and um, time trying to make decisions. And so one of the things is if we can start to look at these thought patterns that we have and see where they are helpful and where they're not helpful, I think that is the key in this um, decision-making process. The other thing for me, and I was a terrible decision maker before I became a coach, I found decision-making really hard and um, we'll talk a little bit about why. And it's very expensive if you find making decisions hard. We spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of energy. We also sometimes spend a lot of money trying to figure out how to make the right decision. Um, and yet this time period where we're not making decisions, <laughs> Um, is actually also very costly. And so not deciding is a decision, we just don't notice it as a decision. And everything that happens in our life every day is a result of decisions. So if you can start to think about the, the cost of not making decisions and also the ease with which you make tons of decisions, where you're getting stuck on these decisions, if they're all just decisions, it can help you step out of that. And if you decide that you don't want to waste time and energy on decision making, knowing that you can always make another decision and that 99% of the decisions we make because we're professional decision makers are good ones. And so we can trust ourselves to make a good decision. And if it doesn't work out the way we think, we can make a different one. And so I think as you're heading into this, just realizing that and getting out of a lot of these thought patterns that is that are um, painful for us can be really helpful. And so one of those is a fear of making a mistake. And so we are trained in medicine that mistakes can kill people. And um, we get in trouble when we make mistakes. We get judged. We get rejected when we make mistakes. And so we don't like to make mistakes 
outside of our life, but we think outside of the exam room and the office, but we think that all these decisions sort of fit in the same category. And so our brain in the background is thinking, I don't want to make a mistake. We also think there's a right and a wrong instead of just choices and options. And so in medicine, sometimes there is a right and a wrong and sometimes there's not. But I think realizing that we are trained to see right and wrong. So we automatically think that there's a right decision and a wrong decision. And we have to make sure we don't make the wrong one because when we make the wrong one, we'll get in trouble. <laughs> something bad will happen. Some We might hurt someone. Um, we also tend to go to the guilt, blame, and shame there. And we tend to um, feel ashamed about it. And that brings this whole other level of cost. And so we get stuck on whether there's a right decision or a wrong decision. We're also afraid of failure, which is very similar. And we've been taught that you know, failure is bad in medicine. <laughs> Um, in other professions, like my son works for a startup, failure is good because you just figure out the next thing. Like then you're trying new things and it's innovating. But in medicine, we don't think that way. And so we bring that to a lot of these other decisions in our lives. You know, say you're trying to um, change jobs. It we're afraid of failure. We're afraid of making a mistake. We think there's a right and a wrong decision when there isn't. We also most of us in medicine dislike uncertainty, and we were trained to dislike uncertainty. We were trained to find certainty, follow the certain path, follow the protocols and the practice guidelines, and any place that we can find certainty, we are much more comfortable. And so when you're making decisions and you can't control the outcome, there is uncertainty there, and we don't like that. <laughs> we think it's potentially dangerous. And so we get stuck trying to make a decision because there's uncertainty with all the decisions and we don't know what to do. Um, so I think realizing that we have these thought patterns in the background can be really helpful. We also have a very strong scarcity mindset, thinking that like the chance that it will work out well is not that good. Um, the chance that it'll work out terrible is very high because that's where our brain looks. We have a negativity bias. We think there are limited good outcomes. Um, and then we also really hate to disappoint people. And we were also taught that disappointing people is dangerous and you may not finish your residency. We, we tend to um, people please everywhere because people who go into medicine do that. And so we, again, don't wanna disappoint people in making a decision. And many people don't make decisions about um, changing jobs. They don't follow the things that they want to do because they're afraid of disappointing people, not realizing that not making a decision might be disappointing yourself. Um, we also want to make outcome-based decisions, and most of the decisions in life, we don't have the outcomes, and so, but we we, get, we judge ourselves if they don't turn out well, it was a bad decision, rather than judging the decision all on its own, and so I think realizing that in medicine, we also do that. If there's a bad outcome, we look back and say it was a bad decision, but it wasn't necessarily a bad decision. It was an outcome that could have come whether we made this decision or another decision, but we use that same thought pattern. So we tend to have a lot of regret. We tend to be mean to ourselves and we tend to not be compassionate if we have a decision that doesn't turn out well. And so it makes it harder to make decisions. And yet those things, regret, being mean to ourselves and compassion are all within our control. And so when you can start to see those challenges coming into your decision-making, it can make making the decisions easier. And I always say, um, the key thing is noticing. That's the mindfulness piece. Because once you see these thought patterns, you're like, oh, that's why I'm stuck here. It doesn't mean you're going to change them. It doesn't mean you're just going to be have not no longer have a scarcity mindset or no longer be worried about disappointing people or no longer being a people pleaser. But as soon as you see how that's impacting your ability to make a decision, it gets easier to make the decisions. So once you've seen those, and I will say there are a lot more, but those are the ones, as I thought about it, that had the biggest impact on decision making. And so once you've kind of identified them, you can see them as you're getting stuck making a decision, as you're spending that expensive energy um, ruminating, which is we're all experts at, weighing, doing pros and cons lists, all of those things actually don't tend to help us get the decision that we want. So the next step, which I mentioned in the last two of these curious about coaching sessions, are that we also can't make good decisions when we are in fight or flight sympathomimetic storm. And so that's where the mindfulness comes in. When you are calm and when your parasympathetic nervous system is working well, and in most of us, it's not working well, um, 
it is much easier to make a decision. When you have self-compassion, which most of us don't, it's much easier to make a decision, meaning you can be kind to yourself. When you are depleted, it's also very hard to make a decision. We tend to be reactive rather than proactive and responsive. We tend to also, when we are in sympathomimetic storm, fight or flight, and um, depleted or exhausted, we tend to not see the options. And so decision-making becomes one or the other and seeing all the bad things with both of those choices. <laughs> and so part of this um, improving your decision-making is taking good care of your nervous system. So um, I teach yoga and anyone's welcome to join me, but working on your breathing, working on your mindfulness, finding ways I, um, in my coaching, I help people find ways to be mindful. For all of us, it's different. It's not just sitting on your mat. So for some people, it's mindful walking. For some people, it's restorative yoga. For some people, it's yin yoga. For some people, it's regular yoga. For some people, it's um, strict meditation. For some people, it's two minutes in the car listening to Headspace. So there's always a way to shift into a more mindful pattern and understanding the things out there that upregulate your parasympathetic nervous system will actually help you make decisions. And so um, if you do nothing else, practice some breathing and um, put your feet up the wall and it will likely help you <laughs> feel more grounded and centered. And then working on self-compassion um, is something else that I think is really important. And so I think sometimes we bring this coaching in and we have our pros and cons list and we're looking at all our thought patterns and changing them. If you don't have those other prerequisites, the coaching doesn't really work. You're not necessarily going to make the decision that you really want if you're coming at it from this fear-based, threatened um, state. So I thought I would give you um, a few tools and strategies, and then we'll I'll answer questions and we'll jump into the um, coaching if people have some. So the first one is to actually learn to listen to yourself. So we tend to have all the shoulds and all the things we're supposed to do. And we were actually taught in medicine not to listen to ourselves. And so pausing and actually listening to yourself and the mindful piece here is without judgment and without striving um, because those are the two things that we tend to bring when we listen, meaning we are judging and striving for something or something we think that we're supposed to want. And so actually really connecting with what you want is important. Mindfulness is essential for that. Learning to listen, slowing down is, is essential to that. And then really getting in touch with what you want. I think many of us know what we want and there are a lot of strategies to figure that out. It's under there. We just haven't paused or we're not willing to see it. And when you can learn how to get back to that through a bunch of different strategies, the decision-making is going to be easier. So allowing yourself to listen and um, being clear about what your priorities are. I often, um, if you struggle with that, like to have you think about how you want to feel. And that can be really helpful with decisions because often we don't know if it's this job or that job, but we know how we want to feel in life. And then you can start to work backwards. Um, so if you want to feel calm and happy, <laughs> happy is a hard one, um, but grounded, for example, you can then look at decisions from that lens, knowing that that is your highest priority. I think sometimes we make people our highest priority. And I think how you want to feel in life, if that's your highest priority, you might get healthy there or you might get energetic there. Um, you probably won't get exhausted, depleted and frustrated. And that will help you uh, make decisions. The next tip is to... Um, honor yourself, which I think means to have your own back. And so this is the thing that I talked about before, the thought patterns where we don't have our own back. We judge them based on the outcome. If they don't turn out the way we think they should, it was a bad decision. So you can decide up front when you make a decision that it was a good decision and that you made the best decision you could. And that can actually help you make decisions because you can decide that you're not going to be mean to yourself, that there isn't a right versus a wrong. There were choices. And I think it's really helpful if you can commit to not regretting and not saying mean things to yourself when you make a decision, it makes it so much easier to make a decision. The other tip that I love here is you can have, even if we have all the what ifs, what if this happens, what if that happens? So if you have your own back, it's even if this happens, I will know what to do. Or even if this happens, it wasn't a bad decision. This thing might happen. It was in my list of all the things I was thinking through. And so I think, um, 
practicing changing what ifs to even if can give you a little bit more groundedness and calm as you're thinking about decisions. And then the next one is honoring the decision. So not only honoring yourself, um, but go all in on it. So you actually can make it the best decision. And so you can decide what do you need to do to make this decision the best decision? What do you need to do to make it turn out? Most of us make a decision and then we sit there and second guess it. And we're like, maybe I should have done that one. Maybe I should have done this one. And then we're not actually helping the decision become a good decision. So once you've made the decision, you just go all in and you decide what are you going to do to make this the best decision? And we are all very proactive, smart people. So we can commit to doing that. Decisions will most likely turn out better. And then if you really don't like it, you, your next decision and your, it can be to make another decision or a different decision. But spending all this time second guessing and going backwards is very inefficient and makes it hard to make decisions if you're going to second guess yourself and continue to do that. And then you get into this really expensive, exhausting cycle of constantly second guessing yourself. So you can also decide that decisions rather than right or wrong are learning. And every physician I know is a lifelong learner. And so you can just say, I'm going to make a decision and learn from it. I'm going to, we, we actually do that in patient care, right? I'm a pediatrician. You start with the amoxicillin, you learn from it. You didn't make a mistake. You just learned that it was resistant and you pick a next one. So you can do that in other parts of your life, but we struggle a little bit um, thinking that if we make a wrong decision, um, we failed. And so instead, if you think of every decision as just getting more information and that you're a lifelong learner, you're going to learn from the decision. We don't really learn from not making decisions. We just sit there stuck. And so realizing that making a decision is learning and growth and then you'll go from there can be a way that gets you out of this just stuck lump in your throat um, decision making. And then the other thing that can be really helpful is noticing all the decisions you make in a day and realizing that you're a really good decision maker. And so noticing all the little things like what you decide to wear, you make pretty good choices. What you decide to eat, you make pretty good choices. Um, you know, you can intentionally decide to um, attend to your marriage or attend to your children or exercise. And so realizing all the healthy decisions that you make in a day, the ones that are good, can actually give you more confidence about making more decisions. And the more decisions you make, you gain more confidence about your decision making. We write off almost all the decisions we make in medicine. So you don't have to focus on those. I would actually focus on the decisions in your life because those are the ones that most people struggle with. Perhaps their career, what I mean is patient care decisions. Most of us don't struggle with those because we do them in a way that's sort of automatic. And a lot of these thought patterns are actually really helpful for those, but they're not necessarily helpful for living a happy, long and healthy life. And they're not helpful for living the fullest life, the one that you want to be living, the one that you are um, engaged and alive in, because it tends to keep us in this safety realm, which is helpful as a physician, but not necessarily helpful as a human. It keeps us out of the um, catastrophic negative outcomes with patient care, but it also keeps us from trying new things and growing outside of our patient care role. Um, so the another tip is to ask yourself helpful questions. So we tend to ask ourselves terrible questions. What if this goes wrong? Um, and so I think asking questions instead of what, um, you know, what terrible thing can happen, you can ask yourself if they both turned out well, what would I choose? I love that one because it takes away the threat of things turning out badly. So if they both turned out well, which one would you choose? Um, you can ask what's the worst that can happen so you know it and you realize what you're afraid of. And it's probably not that bad. Most of the time, it's, our brain is making it into something it's not. So that question can go either way. But if it's helpful for you, I would ask it. I find it really helpful because I sometimes don't even know what's the worst that can happen, but my brain is worried about it. And so when you sort of look at what is the actual worst thing that could happen with this decision, it may not be a big deal. You might decide, oh, well, then I just make another decision. Or say, for example, you're choosing a school for your child. And the worst that could happen is you don't like it and you move them to another school. And then all of a sudden your brain realizes it's not this terrible deal, but it's been going the whole way about maybe you're going to ruin them and they'll have mental health problems and all of these things. And so I think really um, digging into that can be helpful. And then um, I love this question, which is what will the world miss out on if you don't do something? So we always look at what can go wrong, but what will 
not happen if you don't do this thing? What will you miss out on? What will your family miss out on if you don't change your work or you don't move or you don't um, try out something new? And then my favorite question, which most of you are aware of, is what would love do? And I think for making decisions, it's actually super helpful. And that's love for you first. Um, and that's where love, it can be kind if you struggle with love, but I think love is really helpful here. And then love for the other people involved in the decision and love for the world. To me, when I'm sort of thinking about a tough decision with that in mind, it gives you the right answer pretty quickly. If love is not your jam or... Um, it's not quite the right energy for the decision. You can say, what would peace do or what would confidence do? So pick how you want to feel about the decision, throw it in there and see what answer you get. And I think that's a super helpful way to um, think of in a difficult decision situation. You can also consult with your future self. That's one of my favorite um, approaches. And this is tricky. Um, it's not tricky. You just have to think about your decision and which future self you want to consult with. So maybe you want to consult with them later today. Maybe you want to consult with them next week. Maybe you want to consult with them in five years or 10 years. So you have to kind of know where it is and where that right future self is. I'll give the example that I was going to exercise today. And I got there and I was like, oh, I just don't want to go. And I'm sitting in the car and I was like, Later on today, I will be glad that I did it. So then you can consult with that person up there. Your future self will be really happy, even though it seems just like the last thing you want to do right now. Um, so I think it can help you make decisions. And consulting with that future self when things have turned out okay, I say they don't turn out great. But when they turned out okay, what would that future self version tell you to do? It can be a way of getting out of that sympathomimetic storm where you can't make a decision. And then... Um, we tend to focus on all the things we'll lose when we make a decision. So flipping our negative mindset, which is what we all have, um, we have a negativity bias to what will you gain? What wins will happen? What potential wins? So that then you can focus on the sort of forward movement rather than the, um, the fears and failures. And then expecting to feel crappy, uncomfortable when you're making decisions can be really helpful because when we feel that way, we think there's something wrong. We were kind of trained as physicians. If you're uncomfortable, you're doing something wrong. Something bad might happen. It's a clue to needing to be more hyper aware and hyper vigilant. And so realizing that when you're making big decisions, you're not supposed to feel comfortable. You, of course, you're anxious. And um if it comes to your children in particular, I think that it brings in love and it brings in more discomfort. And you just know that, that that's like part of being a parent. So when you're making a decision, you're going to feel uncomfortable. And that doesn't mean that either choice is good or bad. It's just expected part of decision making. And it gets you out of that hypervigilant sympathomimetic reaction to making decisions. And then the last one I mentioned earlier, but remembering that you are a professional decision maker and you make really good, really important decisions all day. So you can likely trust yourself to make a good decision. And probably 99% of the decisions you've made in your life have turned out well. And so I think um, our brain goes to what if this one turns out badly, but I really like to think we're professional decision makers and we are also professional problem solvers. So if it happens to not turn out the way we thought, we will be really good at solving the problem because that's what we do all day. We're very highly trained to do that. And so being able to trust yourself and realize that you have these skills and um, can be just soften, again, get you out of this fear-based decision-making. And I think sometimes we make decisions from a place of fear. And so noticing the energy that you're bringing to decision-making and trying to shift it, right? Because if you're making decisions out of fear, your sympathetic nervous system's going crazy and it's very hard to make a decision. And so all of these actually are helped by um, being mindful, relaxing, softening in, and getting out of this um, really sympathetic, getting out of your sympathetic nervous system, which I wanna say in our society and our culture right now, that's really where most of us live all the time. And so we do have to intentionally practice that. And whether, again, it's with strict mindfulness, whether it's um, I actually did um, true forest bathing yesterday um, with, with a certified forest, not bather, but I don't know what you call them. But anyway, um, and really you can feel your whole nervous system shift. And yet most of us don't spend time in the forest. We spend all our time inside on a computer 
um, without the greenery. So that can be part of shifting your nervous system. Yoga can be part of shifting your nervous system. Sleep can be part of shifting your nervous system. So I think we often don't discount those things when we're trying to make big decisions. And so getting yourself into a healthier state can make your decision-making easier. So who has um, questions? <laughs> 